Good morning, everybody. I'm Zach Blanchard, and this is Political Brew. Joining me this morning are our analysts, Democrat Ethan Strimling, Republican Bill Harriman. Good morning to you both. Good morning. Good morning. You full from Thanksgiving? Or? Yeah, just a little bit. <laughs> Still recovering. Yes. yes. <laughs> we want to start in Portland, where councilors rejected a proposal that would have allowed encampments in the city through the winter. Councilors heard hours and hours of testimony from people on both sides. Ultimately, they decided the encampments have become too dangerous. I subscribe to the idea that they are unsafe from a public health perspective and a public safety, not just to the externalities, but I really am concerned about people within the camps who are exploited every day. Therein lies our difference of opinion. That, of course, is Mayor-elect Mark Dion already trying to take a firm stance on this issue. Ethan, is he taking the right approach here? No, I mean, this is the failed approach. This is the approach the city of Portland has tried for almost a year now. They continue to sweep these camps. They just move people from one place to the next. And when Mayor-elect Dion talks about um, how this is not healthy, the camps are not healthy for the individuals there, what's even more not healthy is sweeping these camps and disrupting their lives. We need to build trust. We need to allow people, we need to not ghettoize everybody in one small postage stamp, let people spread out a little bit, build relationships. That's going to help us get people into shelters. So it's been a failed policy for seven months. Very disappointing that they're carrying it forward. Bill? You know, I think this is an opportune time for Mayor-elect Dion. He, I think, rightly pointed out that there's systemic issues within the homelessness, some of its drug abuse, some of its lawlessness, some of its mental health issues. I'm convinced he's going to uh, approach all of those. And coincidentally, there's a, a, a homeless shelter that's coming online in a few months, uh, which, which uh, house about 100 people, and hopefully they'll take advantage of yeah, that. Yeah, and that'll be the asylum seekers um, freeing up some beds in the right. Homeless Services Center, looking at about like 200 additional beds there now. Um, right. But I think the question is, in terms of the encampments, is was it a strategic move to sweep these encampments and move all of these people to what is now that large encampment on Commercial Street under the bridge? Um, to address it in one spot. And is that the right approach? It, it kind of, it looks like they, they did that and then they're like, oh, now what? Yeah, sorry, it's not the right approach. Small shelters is the right approach when you're talking about actually sheltering people. One of the problems we have right now is we've built these big massive shelters all on the furthest outreaches of the city of Portland. Instead of building small shelters that are you know, designed to individually deal with some veterans or deal with domestic violence or deal with mental health or substance use, people who need to work together to try to find solutions. Instead, we build this one big encampment and it creates the danger. It's a self-fulfilling prophecy. It creates the danger that Mayor-elect uh, Dion is talking about. They should have just broken it up and allowed people to get into shelters. We all want them to sleep inside. Nobody thinks sleeping outside is a good idea. It's nobody's choice. Unfortunately, they chose the wrong path to try to solve that problem. But that public policy has already been vetted. This, this is the direction we're going in, and I agree with your, your premise of your question. It, just moving people around the city is not going to solve the problem. It's, we've got to get them to move onward from where they are today. All right, now to some major international news this week. A four-day ceasefire in the Israel-Hamas war remains in effect. This, of course, allowing for the continued release of some of the estimated 240 hostages taken by the terrorist group, among them some Americans and children. The U.S., Egypt and others have been involved in negotiating this exchange. Here's what the spokesman for the Qatari foreign ministry had to say about it this week. The criteria on which to prioritize the hostages was purely humanitarian, as, uh, as you know, and our focus was on getting the women and children uh, out of harm's way as, uh, as soon as possible, which is basically what we are uh, doing within this, uh, this agreement. Congresswoman Shelley Pingree releasing this statement applauding the move, saying we must work with Israel and the international community to bring a permanent end to the horrific violence and war in the region. Phil, Israel promising this is not the end of the war, though. is So is calling for that um, entire end to the violence realistic here? Well, I, I, hopefully soon, but not realistic at this point. Uh, the Israelis have made it very clear they are going to push ahead until they eliminate Hamas, and I don't think there's any um, change in that position. Ethan. It's right for her to call it. I think we all should be calling for, you know, the end to the violence there. And I think a lot of people are calling for a ceasefire. And thank goodness that we at least have one, however long this lasts, to give a little breath, to get some humanitarian aid uh, into Gaza, and of course, to make sure that these hostages come home. But 
you know, the biggest thing that I think we're seeing is uh, just in tremendous kudos to the Biden administration in this case, working incredibly hard behind the scenes, negotiating between the Israeli government, Egypt, Qatar, trying to make sure how do we get there. And, and from what we hear, Biden had to pressure both sides to accept less than what they wanted, right? Hamas wanted a longer ceasefire. Israel wanted more hostages. He said, you got to take what you can get now and we'll get the rest later. Really tremendous kudos to him. Do you agree, Phil? Oh, uh, more progress needs to be made, uh, a good start, but it's a long way to the finish line. All right, all of this leading to a rise in anti-Semitism, though, across the country. 2024 presidential candidate and Florida Governor Ron DeSantis is under fire for refusing to denounce Elon Musk's anti-Semitic posts. A number of companies have pulled their ads from Musk's social media platform X in response. DeSantis saying, quote, I think what they're doing to him is ridiculous. I think it's crazy to call him anti-Semitic. Ethan, will this be an issue for him in, in the race? Uh, the Republican Party does not seem to punish people who uh, unfortunately express anti-Semitism. I mean, I'm not exactly sure what he considers to be anti-Semitic if that tweet is not anti-Semitic. Remember, this is also a governor who has been okay with banning books about Anne Frank. So maybe he doesn't understand what anti-Semitism is, but everybody else on the planet gets it. Of course, uh, he should have called out clearly Elon Musk, whether he's a friend, whether he's a donor, whatever it is, and just said this is uncalled for and unnecessary. And Phil, at a time when we're seeing this rise in anti-Semitism right, across right. the country, a presidential candidate maybe should be. Absolutely right. I, I, to me, it's appalling what's going on across the country. I didn't have any sense that there was this level of anti-Semitism in our country. And we, any opportunity we get to call it out, including DeSantis, it should be called out. All right, before we take a quick break this week, former president, uh, former first lady, excuse me, Rosalind Carter died, but she leaves behind quite the legacy. The wife of President Jimmy Carter, she was a writer, an outspoken advocate for a number of causes, including mental health. She was 96 years old. We'll be right back. Good morning, everybody. I'm Zach Blanchard, and this is Political Brew. Joining me again this half hour, Democrat Ethan Strimling and Republican Phil Harriman. Good morning. Good, good morning to you both. Good morning. Thanks good for morning. staying with us. Yeah. I want to start with a big moment in Augusta this week. The commission charged with investigating the Lewiston shootings met for the first time. The first task looking for the legislature to give them subpoena power, an effort that's supported by Governor Janet Mills and Attorney General Aaron Fry. But the clock is ticking, setting an aggressive timeline of six months. Now, six months is a very ambitious goal, uh, but highly desirable for obvious reasons. And we will strive to meet it, but not at the expense of failing to establish the truth regarding what occurred. Bill, are they going to be able to get it done? They are going to be able to get it done. If they need more time, I'm sure they'll go back to the governor and ask for it. The governor, in, in her order for this commission to come to life, so to speak, was to tell us what you need, whatever resources you need. Uh, I think she's put together a very re, uh, impressive group of people. Uh, Dan Wathen, who I know personally, is uh, a man of integrity. He's been in uh, the judicial system as the chief justice. Uh, he's the right man for the job, and I'm sure they're going to do it and do it well. Ethan, there have already been some critics, though, saying the legislature should have been involved in the creation of the commission in the first place. Take a look at this post on X from Democratic State Representative Adam Lee from Auburn saying, quote, perhaps it would have made sense for the governor's office to work with this legislature to establish a broad and robust commission with meaningful authorities and power in the first place. Is he right here? Uh, I don't think so, actually. I mean, I, certainly it would be great if Governor Mills had worked with uh, the legislature in some ways, but and I appreciate Representative Lee. Uh, but this is her authority. This is the executive authority. And what frustrates me by that statement is that the legislature has its own authority. They can create a commission if they want to. But more importantly, the legislature should be now looking at policy, right? Their job is to come up with the policy to make sure that this doesn't happen again. We understand we have to understand what happened, but there are some fundamental pieces that states across this country have passed that have prevented these kind of uh, attacks. We've now had three mass shootings in Maine in the last seven or eight months. The legislature needs to take up its authority to pass policy, let this commission do its work, give them the subpoena power they need, 
and focus on their job. Bill? Well, I think it's clear that the legislature is going to be involved because they're the ones who are going to grant the subpoena power. Now would be the time, in my view, if I was in legislative leadership, to work with the governor's office to make adjustments to the authority that's been given. Now is the time to do that. And time will tell if, if that plays out that way. In the 2024 race, former President Donald Trump is officially on the ballot in Maine. Volunteers and supporters gathered outside the state house before submitting signatures to the Secretary of State's office this week. Phil, they say the goal is to get more votes for Maine's first congressional district this time around. It's likely to be a challenge, though. Yeah, for sure. No question about it. I think it's most important to make sure they can hang on to the second congressional district uh, in the because we split our electoral college votes. Make sure that's secured and whatever progress you can make in the first district, uh, good for him. So are you implying that they might not even be able to secure the second district? Oh, I, I don't think they should take it for granted. Uh, my point is that th this is a, a new election new conversations uh, from older people, so to speak, in the in the race. Don't take anyone for granted. Ethan? Yeah, they're never going to win the first CD. I think we'd probably agree with that. I think it's very stre a big stretch for them to even think about winning the state, only the second CD. And there's a decent chance. So he's won it twice, so and he's the only one to have ever split our electoral votes that way, so he's probably going to split them again. You know, it's interesting he's on the ballot, and there are a lot of conversations around the country right now in courts about whether what he engaged in in terms of insurrection around the Constitution, should he even be allowed to get on the ballot? And, you know, I, I think those questions are going to come up in more and more places, might even come up in the state of Maine. Um, it will be very interesting to see how people ruled. Colorado, he engaged in insurrection, but somehow they're still letting him on the ballot. Everybody's looking at that like, what? <laughs> All right, speaking of 2024, a bit of a pop culture mishap for President Joe Biden this week on his 81st birthday. Take a listen. They had to work hard to show patience and be willing to travel over a thousand miles. You could say even this harder than getting a, a ticket to the Renaissance tour or, or, or Rip Britney's tour. She's down in, it's kind of warm in Brazil right now. And made those remarks during the annual pardoning of the turkeys at the White House this week, appearing to mix up Taylor Swift and Britney Spears here. Phil, already Republicans are pouncing on this, basically bringing into question if he's fit enough to hold office. Well, the, it, everybody who's been following the president can agree that his cognitive abilities have diminished over time, but I want to acknowledge that I probably wouldn't be able to tell you the difference between a Taylor Swift and a Britney Spears. <laughs> <laughs> At least you're being honest. At least you're being honest. Do you, do you even know who the, what the uh, Renaissance yep. tour is in reference yes, to, by the way? Yes, I do. Beyonce. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. All right. All right. I'm, just, I'm just checking to see if you know Beyonce, too. Yeah, I mean, this is the silliest of the silly. The Republican Party, I mean, those of us who talk for some part of our living, we always mess up words, you know. Especially so, you. Especially <laughs> you. We've had some, you know, he and I have had some great ones where we've gone on on chatting about things that weren't even on the subject so uh, but it's silly you know in in the same week that president biden has been able to negotiate hostages being released from from gaza and making sure that there's a ceasefire in place during that same week this is what republicans want to talk about the american people are like give me a break the president is doing the job that they expect him to do so no this is not any reflection on his cognitive ability all right, something totally different. It is the Thanksgiving weekend, so thought we could address some serious issues when it comes to our Thanksgiving food that was on our plate. So I'll ask the questions to both of you. All right. And mm. I know you wanted to make it a little bit politically related, but <laughs> we've had enough of that. So <laughs> stuffing cooked inside the bird or out? Bill? Inside. Uh, you know, I'm actually okay with it out. I like it inside too, but uh, this year was out and I'm pretty good. It's all about the flavor. Yeah. All right, turkey, white meat or dark meat? Bill? White. Oh, I do a little bit of both. You know, I'm the Democratic Party. Uh, we embrace everybody. <laughs> embrace everybody. <laughs> everybody. <laughs> everybody. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> and finally, cranberry sauce. I think this is the big one. Um, from the can or from scratch? Bill? Either one. Either uh, one. Either one. Yeah. Both, both of you. Of, yeah. No, no. I'm actually. I like from scratch actually, and made a little bit this year, which was kind of fun. My partner and I made some cranberry sauce. It was excellent. Wow. Maybe I'll bring you some. I was going to say, where is it? <laughs> I know. I should exactly. Have. I'm a can guy though. So. Oh, really? <laughs> That's going to do it for us this week. Thank you both for being You're with welcome. us. Thank Before you. we go, a quick reminder to catch Meet the Press with Kristen Welker coming up at 10 o'clock right here on New Center, Maine. The Morning Report is back right after this.